Welcome to Distressed to Joyful, Bailey's Way. I'm your host, Bailey Raber, here to enlighten you and the rest of the world about one of the most misunderstood mental disorders out there, bipolar disorder. Each week, we're going to learn more about my personal journey with the disorder while leaving you enriched with new information on how you can help better yourself as well as those around you. Hello, friends. So my college course officially started two weeks ago. And my God, it was a total shit show. (laughs) So the world of going to school right now is pretty chaotic for anybody, I would assume. A lot of the classes at the community college that I'm at are all online via Zoom. And then you've got hybrid classes that are in Zoom and in person. And then you've got in-person classes. Me being the person that I am, I need in-person classes. I can't do this online stuff. It's just too much. I need an actual place to be focused and paying attention, right? So I signed up for in-person. Duh. Then I get an email saying, okay, well, the first two weeks of class are going to be all online. And only if your instructor says it's going to be online. So here's how you can look that up. So I'm going to be prepared. I look things up. Nope, there's no notification. Okay, I must be in person. My professor said nothing different. Let's go. So I showed up to school uh, probably about 15 or 20 minutes before class. I do the COVID screening and I find my room and it's completely empty and dark. I was like, okay, this is not a good sign. And there's some other kid who walks up and same thing. He's like, are you in this class? And I was like, yeah. And he was like, this is not look good. I was like, well, maybe they're just running late. Let's just hang out and wait. So class was supposed to start at 6 o'clock, and by 6.05, he and I were like, okay, well, something's not right here. So I go talk to the guy who I did the COVID screening with, and he radios some lady in some other building and tells me to go over there, that she can help me figure out where the heck my class is. Well, I get over there, and I speak with this woman, and she was like, hey, um, have you checked your Canvas? And I was like, what the heck is Canvas? What is this? Y'all, I'm a first-time college student, and nobody thought to teach me what the hell this Canvas thing was, and that is where you access all of your course stuff and information. And lo and behold, there is a announcement from my professor explaining how class is going to work. But I didn't find that announcement on Canvas until, first of all, I went all the way up to the library, got settled on a computer, and got logged into Canvas. Some dude a couple of computers down helped me because I was like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. So I got logged in and he showed me these videos. He's like, you should just watch these videos. It teaches you how to use Canvas. And I was like, okay. So I just sit there for 45 minutes watching these videos, watching, watching these videos while I'm thinking, okay, class is probably just like on your own basis. He showed me where I could log into WebEx and it wasn't there. So he was like, okay, maybe it's just like that. And then he showed me how I could email my professor. So I sent her this email, and I'm watching these videos. And all of a sudden, I decide to look at my phone, and I was like, oh, crap. She responded to me and said, class is happening right now in Zoom. It is now 7.15, y'all. 7.15, an hour and 15 minutes after class was supposed to have started. I get logged into this Zoom finally, but I'm on a library computer, so there's no webcam, no microphone, no nothing. It was a disaster. (laughs) But you know what? I learned a lot. I learned what Canvas was. I learned how to access all of my course information. I learned how to find where I'm going to do all my assignments and shit. So it wasn't a bad thing, but it was a very, very interesting first day of college for a 27-year-old who's never done college before. (laughs) Oh, man. Thankfully, though, this week we are doing in-person classes, which I'm super excited about. But yeah, I just thought I would share that experience because I don't know what I was expecting going to college. I mean, I've never done it before, but I will tell you I was not expecting that much chaos. That's for sure. (laughs) And I wanted to tell you guys about this really interesting book that I read recently. It's called The Good Stuff from Growing Up in a Dysfunctional Family by Karen Casey. 
So before reading this book, I didn't see any real positives from growing up in my dysfunctional family. But reading this brought a very strange sense of relief. It was kind of like, damn, bad stuff happened to me, but these things actually created the strong, badass woman that I am today. So, hmm. It was definitely a perspective shift for me in a way that I was not expecting when I originally picked up the book, but it's definitely worth reading, and rest assured, the link can be found in the show notes. So go check that out and give it a read, especially if you grew up in dysfunction like I did. It's, it's worth it, I promise. Okay, so let's get into today's episode. Manic Spending Sprees. So raise your hand if you know the correlation between bipolar disorder and overspending. Okay, I assume that maybe, just maybe, 25% of y'all listening were actually able to raise your hand. If that. If that. Like, I'm being generous of saying 25%, (laughs) y'all. Okay, so remember back in episode two of the first season of the show titled Bipolar Disorder, what exactly is that? When I explained about the different types of bipolar disorder, and then I explained what mania and depression are. Okay, the episode was a long time ago, so I'll give you a quick refresher course because I am nice. (laughs) As defined on verywellmind.com, A manic episode is characterized by a sustained period of abnormally elevated or irritable mood, intense energy, racing thoughts, and other extreme and exaggerated behaviors. People can also experience psychosis, including hallucinations and delusions, which indicate a separation from reality. That last part is typically for bipolar 1, just so you guys know. And depressive episodes are characterized by feelings of sadness, emptiness, hopelessness, or depression, or crying for no apparent reason. And although irritability is not formally listed as a symptom of a major depressive episode in depressed adults, the individual may be abnormally bad-tempered, cross, and touchy. This information was also sourced from an article on VeryWellMind.com, and you can find the link to that on the show notes for this episode. Okay, now that we've all received a refresher course, I will connect the dots for you and the answer to the presented question. So, what exactly is the correlation between bipolar disorder and overspending? When an individual is experiencing symptoms of bipolar mania, that internal spark can trigger impulsive actions that can have long-term consequences on your finances. And that was found in an article on psychcentral.com. But in other words, what it's saying is overspending can occur due to the tense feelings of invincibility that come along with a manic episode which can often put the person spending into debt or other financial troubles. All right, let's have story time so I can give you some examples from my life that will help make this make a little more sense. Yay, story time! Okay, where do I even begin? Oh, man. Y'all, I had some serious problems with overspending in my early 20s. Oh gosh, seriously. But thankfully, I only had one credit card with a $1,000 limit. And I was level-headed enough not to open any department store credit cards, so my debt didn't really get too out of control. I did, though, have lots of trouble with paying my bills, and I would often have to ask family members for help to pay them. Y'all, I really hate admitting that, but it's the sad truth. Oh, man. So let's talk about some specific examples. So sometimes when a manic-like episode would start to come in, 
I would feel like my money would never run out. Obviously, that was absolutely untrue, especially during the years when I was working one job as a restaurant server. But if I was on the manic side of life and I received some massive tip, I would 100% go out and spend it on some item that I would either rarely use, like a pair of heels that I did not have an outfit to match, nor a place to wear these super cute heels to, or I would purchase something that I would never even touch, like all of the books that I always swore I was going to read but didn't until five years later, Or I lost interest in them and donated them, making it an absolute waste of money. Side note, being a server is not the best work environment for an an individual who's not steadily working to keep their bipolar disorder under control. Pretty much the entire serving staff drinks heavily or does recreational drugs, so therefore, at some point, you will end up drinking and or participating in recreational drugs. And the tips that you receive are based upon how generous people are feeling, so it's kind of like gambling, which is also not good for those of us with bipolar disorder to actually participate in. And the long hours on your feet suck which has absolutely nothing to do with bipolar disorder. I just felt like throwing that in there because it is absolutely true. Oh man, I don't miss those days at all. (laughs) All right, getting back on topic. On some occasions when I would be feeling really good about myself, I would be rolling in the deep of whatever high of the manic episode that I was currently going through and I would decide to browse some retail stores for some new outfits to continue feeling good about myself. I mean, come on, think about it. When you go and you try on a really cute outfit and you're in the dressing room and you're like, damn, I look so good right now. Like, that's the kind of thing that I would do often with all kinds of outfits that weren't exactly necessary. Like, I would buy clothing to wear to a party or to go out clubbing, which I never actually really participated in, or whatever the case might be. Like, evening wear or tight dresses or shirts, short, shirt, shirt skirts, (laughs) or short skirts, just things that could not be worn in a work environment or really anywhere that I had time to go. Because being a server, you are working on the weekends. So where the hell am I going to wear these fancy clothes to on the like the weekdays, right? And a lot of the time, I worked two jobs during my 20s. So I was working in an office and as a server. So these clothes I was buying were not things that I could wear to work, nor to the restaurant I worked at. So why the hell was I buying them? Seriously. And because I worked so much, I didn't have time to actually go do something to wear these two. You see how not sense that makes? Not sense. No sense. None is being made right now. Oh my gosh, y'all. And then when I lost 60 pounds back in 2019, I ended up donating seven or more trash bags full of clothing that I couldn't wear and probably 50% of that still had tags on it. They still had tags on them. Like 50% of that stuff. How sad is that? All of that money spent that is once again wasted. And then at some point, I had gained all of that weight that I just talked about losing. (laughs) So clothes didn't make me feel good anymore. But you know what did? Purses and shoes. Those two things would always look good on me no matter what I weighed. So my first obsession was coach purses. Oh man, I would buy a new one every so often, you know, usually every couple of months, and spend money that I should have been putting towards rent or other bills on these damn purses. 
Oh, I had so many. I had probably 15 or more at one point that were just chilling in my closet because I wouldn't reuse them. When I was ready for a new purse, I would just buy a new one. No reusing. I would buy a fucking new one. It was ridiculous. And then later, my obsession changed from Coach to Kate Spade. And while I am still obsessed with Kate Spade to this day, I no longer make impulse purchases to buy bags and shoes by Kate Spade. Dude, I seriously used to go into places like Marshall's or Nordstrom Rack, and I would specifically seek out Kate Spade stuff that was discount priced, but still not in my budget, and then buy it right then and there. Like, I would go to those shoe racks and look through, and I didn't even give a shit what the shoe looked like, or I wasn't looking for a specific kind of shoe. I was looking for Kate Spade. And when I found a Kate Spade box, then I would check out the shoe and see that it fit me, and it was actually cute. Like, that's ridiculous. That's how obsessed I was, like, specifically seeking out her stuff. Oh, man. But thankfully, my spending sprees were usually pretty small. I don't think I ever spent more than, I think, 200 bucks on a single spree. So I am super, super, super blessed that my sprees never got to the point of incredibly difficult to return from. But I do know that that's not the case for everyone. So I found an article on everydayhealth.com titled Bipolar Disorder and Money Management, which gives some super helpful tips on how to get your spending under control. So I'm going to list out some practical tips that they recommend to help compulsive spenders with bipolar disorder. They say to keep only one credit card with a low limit, Check. I did that. That was good. (laughs) Um, Have several care partners in place. And guys, a care partner is basically someone that you trust to help keep you on track with your spending, just to kind of oversee your budgeting, um, being your accountability partner. You know, you have that accountability partner for working out that like you text each other and you're like, hey, let's go work out. Or did you work out today? This is someone who you're like, hey, did you spend money today? And what did you spend money on if you did? That kind of thing. They also say to let one trusted care partner monitor your bank account and your credit cards. They say to keep most of your money in non-liquid investments such as CDs. They recommend taking classes in financial planning. And they also say that you can join Debtors Anonymous which is a 12-step program that helps participants deal with many different aspects of overspending. So Debtors Anonymous kind of sounds like what AA would be, which AA is Alcoholics Anonymous, for those of you who are unaware and naive. And (laughs) just kidding, not naive. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Uh, Anyways, I do know that Alcoholics Anonymous is a very good program that has helped many, many individuals overcome alcohol addictions. So with that being said, I kind of think that Debtors Anonymous could do the same thing. I don't know from personal experience. I'm just making a loose opinion based upon facts that has nothing to do with the specific program. But (laughs) I feel like it's worth checking out if this is something that you really, really need. Or even if it's not something that you really, really need. Even if it's something that you think you might need. It's still worth checking out, guys. And I will tell y'all that from my own personal experience, that asking for help with a personal problem in your life is extremely difficult. Like reaching out to others and saying, hey, can you help me? Is so, so tough, especially when the thing you need help with is personal and private or even shame triggering. Like when it came to money management, I decided to reach out to a friend of mine back in 2019 who worked in finance, and I asked him to help me get my personal finances under control. Choosing to reach out to him definitely took courage, 
Oh, man, it took courage. And I thought about it for weeks until I finally did it. Because telling him something like, hey, I really suck at managing my money. Can you help me? Is hard. Because first of all, you have to admit that you have a problem, that you suck at something, which (laughs) managing your money is not the greatest thing to suck at. Like, that's actually kind of scary when you think about it. But also... Just the fact of having to tell somebody what you're struggling with. It can be shameful. It can. And money is one of those things that people don't like to talk about. So I totally get it, dude. I've been there. But I will tell you that I am so, so, so fucking thankful that I did it. Because talking to him meant that I could get a plan. And that's what happened. He helped me with a bit of a plan. Now, granted, I didn't stick to it all the way, but (laughs) he did get me started. And also, he gave me some resources on things I could check out online that would help me out. And also, he kind of just made more sense of what I should be doing with my money. Now, that probably didn't make any sense. (laughs) Now, (laughs) Now that I say that out loud... But because he was an outside perspective, he could look at it from a more clear, level-headed point of view. You know what I mean? It's like a therapist. A therapist doesn't tell you how to do things, but when you sit down and like talk with them about stuff, they can help you plan what you need to do using their guidance. And that's what he did. So if you are currently struggling with your finances... Whether or not you have bipolar disorder, I strongly encourage that you ask for help. Find a trusted person in your life who you know is better at finances than you and talk to them. Seriously, the first step is just asking for help. Once you get over that hump, it gets easier. It does. But also, you can find a ton of free information online to help you get better with money. You should definitely check out the Budget Nista on Instagram. So I follow her and her teachings actually really, really helped me. And so I know that they can help you. This woman went to being like super freaking indebted to now paying for her house and her cars and stuff in cash. Like it's ridiculous. I know that she has a bunch of stuff online. She might also have a podcast. I'm not 100% sure about that, but I know that she has guest starred on podcasts because that's how I first learned about her. But regardless... Her link will be in the show notes, so you should check her out. It's going to be very useful to your life. I promise you. I know this as an outside source of your life and what you need, so just do it. (laughs) Uh, Anyways, that was kind of a joke. I hope you laughed. All right, so. (laughs) All right, getting back on topic. If you are currently struggling with out-of-control spending as a symptom of your bipolar disorder, Please, please, please know that you are not alone. And that the spending that is occurring is exactly what I just said. It is a symptom of your bipolar disorder that can be overcome and managed. I know that to be true because, guys, I have just told you about a bunch of overspending that occurred when I was younger. I will tell you right now that I have problems with spending money on materialistic items that cost more than $20 nowadays. Like seriously, I am such a cheap ass. Like I don't like spending money. I don't mind spending money on food. Let me just set that straight. But also, I limit how often I go out to eat. I don't buy clothes and shoes unless I need them. And again, I don't want to spend more than 20 freaking dollars on it. That's why Poshmark is a lifesaver, just saying. (laughs) But I went from out of control spending to, I wouldn't say a financial wizard. That would be very extreme. That's the budget Nista. She's a financial wizard. (laughs) But I will say that I have everything under control. I have my credit cards under control. I don't have large sums of debt anymore. I know how to budget. 
I learned all of these things and I stopped the out of control spending. And I managed my bipolar disorder. All of these things are doable, guys. They are so freaking doable. But something else that I want to note really quickly is that sometimes our family and friends who aren't familiar with how bipolar disorder can affect people, they'll have a really, really hard time understanding that these kind of behaviors, like the overspending, are exhibited due to the disorder itself. I mean, I can think back to when I would ask my parents for help and they would literally shame me for my overspending. And it sucked and it was awful. And I don't think that they purposely did it. I really just think that they did not understand that I was overspending as a result of how my bipolar disorder was affecting me. I think that they just thought that I wasn't trying hard enough, which is not the case. And that can be super, super difficult when you're having money problems and the people around you think that it's your own fault when it's literally a symptom of your mental health and it not being managed properly and All of that just sucks. Trust me, I've been there. It sucks. So if that's anything that you've dealt with or you've gone through, dude, send those people this episode so that they can hopefully better understand how overspending and bipolar disorder are literally correlated to each other. It is. I wish I would have had something like this that I could have shared with my parents and hopefully helped them to see and understand the situation in a better light. Because getting yelled at and talked down to for something that you're not fully capable of controlling in the moment is rough. And dealing with the consequences of these out-of-control spending things is rough enough on its own. So having somebody come and shame you for it on top of that it's it's crushing, guys. It's soul crushing. It is. And like I said, I don't think that they purposely did it. I just don't think that they understood what the hell was actually going on, you know? So my hope for you and whoever is listening out there, whether or not you are diagnosed with bipolar disorder or if you know somebody who is, My hope is that you'll have more compassion and empathy towards those struggling with this kind of scenario. I hope that you'll look at somebody who comes to you and says, hey, I need help with my finances. I'm having troubles. And instead of trying to come down to the bottom to it or like giving them a hard time, I hope you'll look at them and you'll say, You know, I haven't been there myself, but I'm sure that sucks and that must be difficult. And I'm so proud of you for coming to me and asking for the help that you need. Let's take a look and see what we can do. All right, I'm going to close this episode before I get all teary-eyed because that's how I'm feeling right now. (laughs) Well, let's go ahead and move into what? A weirdo. Because even though y'all are not sending me your weirdo things that you do, fortunately for you, I've come up with more weirdo things that I do that I'm happy to share with you guys. And today I am happy to tell you, happy, I don't, yeah, happy, happy to tell you that I hate avocados with a fucking passion. Oh my God, so many of y'all are just cringing right now and there's anger boiling inside of you because for some reason, the entire population of the United States is obsessed with avocados. They're on t-shirts, they're on swimsuits, they're on your socks, they're in your breakfast, your lunch, and your dinner. You eat them for a snack. You put them in your ranch fucking dressing. Like, y'all, I had to stop ordering a specific salad. I think it was at 
Chick-fil-A because it came with an avocado ranch dressing. Gross. Like the texture of them is gross. It's all mushy and like baby food and then it doesn't even taste good. So I can't even get over the texture fact because the texture and the taste both suck. (laughs) I'm going to get so much hate mail for this and I don't even care because I hate avocados, which makes me weird because America loves them. Still, I don't know why. If you know why everybody loves avocados, please send me a message and tell me because I would love to understand what's so fucking great about them. Thank you. (laughs) Okay, so next week we are going to talk about feeling our feelings. Ooh, I am so very excited for this one. (laughs) Haha. <laughs> but four years ago, I would have never said that I was excited to talk about my feelings, much less feel my feelings. Though I can say that I have learned over the past few years the importance of actually feeling your feelings, the good and the bad feelings, and how it can enhance your life tremendously. So trust me, you do not want to miss this episode. It's going to be a good one. Thank you for tuning into the show. I appreciate all of you listening. And I don't know if you saw on social media recently, but I've had over 3,000 downloads of the show so far, which is phenomenal. And that's all thanks to you. So again, thank you. I appreciate you. If you enjoy the show, leave your girl a review on Apple Podcast. That helps me help the world understand why they should join you in listening to me. <laughs> also, don't forget to follow Distressed to Joyful underscore Bailey's Way on Instagram, where you can stay up to date with all of the latest news pertaining to the show. Until next time, take it easy, stay grateful, and be joyful. Bye!